I'm going to take a couple of minutes and be incredibly thankful. <laughs> um, stress, stress, stress. I am actually very thankful to be uh, part of this evening's um, work and festivities and, and to uh, line us up for what's to come. I have a couple of confessions to make before I uh, get started into my prepared notes. Uh, one is that for those of you who don't know me, and I know some people out there do, uh, I am an advocate. I'm an advocate by personal trade, and I'm a professional advocate. So a lot of what I'm going to say tonight is going to be with that filter, and I just want everyone to be clear about that. I specifically advocate on behalf of low-income um, families and households in the state of Colorado. I work at the Colorado Center on Law and Policy, and I am uh, funded by a number of people, uh, funders, who believe in some of the same things that I believe in. And one of those things that we really work hard on is this concept of economic self-sufficiency and economic security throughout the lifespan. Oddly enough, when you have that conversation, you are by default, not just in Colorado, but in my space in Colorado, you are by default talking about women. And so that is what I'm going to talk to you about tonight. What are the choices that we have? Do all of us have the same choices? And what does that cost us? Or how does that enhance us economically? So a slide is going to come up that is going to, talk, that is going to um, help us talk about what a, woman's life, a Colorado woman's life looks like, or her economic life. And I want to uh, put some clarity around some of the definitions before I dig deeper into this. The self-sufficiency wage is the, is the space that I live in and the space that I um, work to get others to live in. And that wage is what it takes to make ends meet without public or private assistance. What that means is that you can provide for your family in terms of housing, clothing, transportation, food, and any kind of extra 10% uh, miscellaneous items, which I like to call the toilet paper category. Those types of, of places. This is, this is a bare minimum piece. This is not, you know, movies out or a dinner or a bottle of wine. This is what it takes to actually keep your family together in Colorado. And it's based on, as Dr. Diana Pierce created the formula, it's based on space and time. In Colorado, that means county and family composition in the time that you're raising your family. It specifically means the time and age of those kids because they're expensive. I don't have any, but I know they're expensive. So that is part of what we'll be talking about tonight because that is a piece that is very, very specific to where women stay. That's, that's our place. Next to the self-sufficiency wage, which in Larimer County, Larimer County represents a, a pretty good uh, chunk of the counties in Colorado, and that's why we picked this piece. Um, is the median family income. And this is how much uh, folks make um, across the state. And what that 51,000 represents is the price at which we set goods. That's the salary we use when we're thinking about what the market will bear. And so when you see people paying a lot of money for milk, or you see people not buying milk at all, it is, it is based on that price. Now, where do women sit in most of this? Our median income across the state is somewhere between full-time minimum wage and the self-sufficiency wage. Indeed, even though we are now the majority of the workforce, we are at $25,000 a year. $25,000 a year is what it takes for one individual living in any county across the state of Colorado to make ends meet. And yet, dozens of women, maybe 35 to 40 percent of us, are doing that for ourselves and for our families because we are indeed the earners, the breadwinners today. And that's our unique space. 
Some of us who um, maybe haven't had options for education are making less than that. And that's the federal poverty level at 18,000 and or below the federal poverty level, at which point public assistance programs kick in and you are clearly not self-sufficient. These are all the places where you can find women. This is where you will find the cashier, where you will find the hotel maid, where you will find the teacher, where you will find the nonprofit advocate, and, <laughs> and other folks like that. And that is where we tend to reside. The reason I was excited about talking about this tonight is because a couple of things have changed here in Colorado that put us in a very unique position to recreate this, this uh, setup. One of the things that has changed is that we have policymakers, and we have had for a couple of years now, policy makers who are majority women. These are women who have childcare issues, women who are caregivers for their aging parents, women who are making somewhere along this line in terms of uh, salaries. And they have a unique understanding of what it is that other women can present to them about how hard it is to make ends meet. That is one thing that makes Colorado a place to be when we're talking about how we move the dial on these numbers. Another thing is the, the first thing that I mentioned, which is we are now the majority of the workforce. And that's a good thing, because I think for a while that's where uh, some women were trying to go. Uh, that's what the movement was about. Being the majority of the workforce, however, at below self-sufficiency doesn't do anyone any good. Being in the majority of the workforce when you are penalized for taking time off, for caring for your children or caring for your elders, doesn't do anyone any good. Being in the majority of the workforce when you don't have a say about how that work is gonna be handled doesn't do anyone any good. And so we are challenged right now to, have, to take advantage of this opportunity and to say, as Lily Ledbetter did, I am here, I need, I need you, you definitely need me. How can we talk about these numbers? What are my new options? Where can I go from here? Do I have to lose out 23 cents on the dollar because I have ovaries instead of that other thing? Um, <laughs> do I have to lose an opportunity for a promotion because it's important for me to make sure that my ailing grandmother doesn't die in poverty and has my support. That's where we are today. Tracy, those are sobering numbers, but so essential to bring out into the community. I think that there's still a perception that women's achievements have been far greater, if you will, economically than they really are, so thank you for for telling us about that. A question that I have for you is this necessarily impacts work for women. Elder care, child care, navigating the multiple roles that women have and the responsibilities that they have. And I wondered, what, what do you see in the workplace that's a possibility in terms of being able to accommodate and lift up and take advantage of the richness of both men and women in the workplace. Does that vision exist for you? It does. Uh, actually, it exists for me in, in two, two parts of my life. When I was growing up, my father was in the service, and so I'm a military brat. And military brats are heavily subsidized folks living in poverty. So I had free childcare, my mom had free childcare, access to free childcare, and access to free healthcare. And uh, most folks, even though the salaries of your uh, breadwinning uh, parent uh, were, you know, kind of lower middle class, um, most folks had housing allowances. So if you can take care of those three things, if you can take care of cutting the expenses for low-income folks who are getting up and going to work every day, you can make a difference in their lives. That's the first place where I, I can envision what it can look like. And what it looks like 
our communities of healthy kids who are thriving. Uh, what it looks like are parents who have the time and the energy to sit down and read to their children because they're not working three jobs to make ends meet. And what it looks like are, you know, me. Uh, <laughs> children who grow into adults who push the needle even further. The second place I can imagine of what it looks like is in the work that I do now. As I said, I, I work for a nonprofit, and we work in collaboration with a number of other nonprofits, and we work in collaboration with a number of our funders. So what it looks like for me is coming to a table um, where men and women gather together once a month at the Women's Foundation of Colorado and talk about the next big policy move. What is possible for women and their families? What barrier, what political or policy barrier is in the way that we can change or modify or simply get rid of so that women and their families can move forward? That's what it looks like to me. What it looks like is uh, the Colorado Center on Law and Policy where you have a group of folks who get together on a regular basis and talk about new and, and uh, innovative ideas for approaching the way that we interact with our policymakers, with those big systems, and with those major changes that can come into play. That's what it looks like. And what's interesting about that is that it is, it's men and women sitting down at a table talking about those bigger issues. It's not men telling women, it's not women crying about men. It's all of us together. Thank you. That's great. Good job.